Hello, this is Amir, and in this video we'll be going over field heart monitoring and management. Whenever you order any kind of test in medicine, whether it's a CBC, chest x-ray, there should be a purpose behind it, and the results should guide you in your management of the patient. So when we do field heart monitoring for our patient, the purpose is to prevent morbidity and mortality to the fetus. The way field heart monitoring allows us to prevent this is when there is evidence of hypoxemia in the baby, their blood becomes slightly more acidic and that results in neurologic depression. And when there is depressed neurologic activity, there causes a change in the field heart rate. And what we look for is this change and ideally treat the baby and the mother to prevent any permanent damage. Field heart rate monitoring could be either done during pregnancy or antenatally, or during labor or intrapartum. Antenatal monitoring includes non-stress tests, which are called NSTs, or contraction stress tests, which are called CSTs. When you monitor someone in labor, it could be either intermittent, and by intermittent I mean you can monitor them for 20 minutes, wait an hour, monitor again, or it could be continuous and we choose between intermittent or continuous depending on the patient, specific maternal conditions, or specific fetal conditions. Before we talk about reading and interpreting tracings, let's talk about the two ways fetal heart rates can be monitored. There's external and internal monitoring. For external monitoring, there are two monitors that are placed on the mother's abdomen. You can see them illustrated in the picture over here and here. The transducer uses ultrasound technology to pick up the heart rate, but because both the fetus and the mom has a heart rate, it is possible that you may accidentally pick up the maternal heart rate. Usually this is obvious because the maternal heart rate is much lower than the fetal heart rate, but the best way to differentiate between these two is to have some sort of heart rate monitor on the mother as well, such as a pulse oximeter, so you can see two distinct heart rates at the same time. The tocometer also goes on the abdomen, and this measures contraction frequency. What's important to note that if you're using external monitoring, it only measures frequency and does not measure strength. Because these monitors are external and go in the mother's abdomen and not in the uterus, these are used for antepartum and intrapartum monitoring, as opposed to internal monitoring, which is only used in labor because the patient has to have their water broken or ruptured amniotic sac. For internal monitoring, you can measure the heart rate directly and therefore more precisely using a fetal scalp electrode, also known as an FSE. This is a very long wire with a thin metal spiral at the end that attaches directly onto the fetus. It usually attaches to the scalp, but it will work on any part of the baby. Relative contraindications for use of an FSE is maternal HIV and hepatitis because it can increase the risk of transmission to the fetus. Also, you'd like to avoid using an FSC if it's a face presentation because you don't want to poke the baby in the eyes. An intrauterine pressure catheter, also called an IUPC, is a thin catheter that goes into the uterus and it actually rests between the fetus and the wall of the uterus. When there's a contraction, the catheter is squeezed between the baby and the uterus and this allows the monitor to see when the contractions occur and it also allows to see how strong they are. Remember, a external monitor can only tell the frequency but an internal monitor can actually measure frequency and strength. These are recorded in Montevideo units, or MVUs. An IUPC can also allow you to perform what's called an amnioinfusion, which allows fluid to be put back into the uterus. This can be useful if you are seeing deep variable decelerations and you think these are due to compression of the umbilical cord. By putting more fluid into the uterus, you create more room around the cord and will hopefully alleviate the stress from cord compression. Because these are internal monitors and you're putting a foreign object inside the uterus, this will increase the risk of infection. It is important to note that you can mix and match internal and external monitors. For example, you can use an FSC with an external tachometer or an IUPC with an external transducer. You only use both if the benefit of an internal monitor is needed. In other words, if you could get the feel heart rate with just the external monitor, you do not need to use an FSC. And if you do not need to know the contraction strength or do not need to do an amniotic fusion, then you should be using an external tachometer. A general principle of labor management is that you want to reduce the number of times anything goes inside the vagina, whether that's digital exams or internal monitoring. 
because any time any additional or unnecessary exams are done or internal monitors are placed, you do increase the risk of infection. And again, since the water has to be broken for these monitors to be placed inside the uterus, we only use them in labor or intrapartum. Now let's take a closer look at the output of the monitors. Your standard fetal monitor strip will have the following format. In the top section here, you'll have the heart rate. In the bottom section over here, you'll have the contraction. The x-axis represents time. Each small block here represents 10 seconds. There is a dark line every six blocks, and this represents one minute. On the y-axis here, we have beats per minute. For most standard field heart rate monitoring, you'll have a line every 10 beats per minute. However, for this video and this figure here, I included lines every five beats per minute just to make it a little bit easier to teach. Down here on the y-axis, if you are using an IUPC, you can use these numbers to measure your MBUs. Sometimes here you may also see the maternal heart rate, but typically it is much lower than the fetal heart rate, usually hovering around 80s to 100s. When you are reviewing a tracing, there's a standard way that uses four components to describe the tracing. These are baseline, variability, accelerations, decelerations, and if there are decelerations, you'll also describe the type. It is always mentioned in this particular order. Again, that's baseline, variability, accelerations, and decelerations. When talking about contractions, usually we just mention the frequency, and that's measured in minutes. The duration of a contraction is measured from the start point to the end point here. And the frequency of contractions is measured from the start of one contraction to the starting point of a second contraction. So this area here represents the duration. And this area from the beginning of this contraction here to the beginning of the second contraction here is how we measure frequency. If you are having more than five contractions per 10 minutes, that's what we call taxistole. We'll review that in more details in just a little bit. Let's talk about baseline first. If you look at tracing, you can see it usually hovers along a certain rate. From there, it can go up or down briefly, and then it usually returns to that baseline rate. That specific heart rate, when averaged over 10 minutes, is called a baseline. So if you look at this tracing right here, you see that it's hovering around this area in general. It may go up, but it comes back down again. Again, up, and it comes back down again. So we would say the baseline for this tracing is over here at 135. When you describe a baseline, you always round to the nearest five beats per minute. So if you saw the actual number was 137, you wouldn't say that. Instead, you would go to 135. If you do see ups or downs, there are periodic changes, you do not include that in your average to determine the baseline. A normal heart rate for a fetus is between 110 to 160 beats per minute. You must know these numbers when you're preparing for your OBGYN shelf. Tachycardia is anything above 160 beats per minute. Some things that can cause tachycardia include maternal fever or dehydration. And bradycardia is less than 110 beats per minute. So with baseline, we were looking at the heart rate over a long period of time. However, with variability, we're looking at the second to second or beat to beat fluctuations from baseline. When we look at variability, we are looking from the peak or the highest point to the next lowest point or the trough. So over here in this specific example, this goes from 175 to 145. And the difference between those is 30. A normal level for variability is what we call moderate and that's between 6 to 25. Again, this is another set of numbers that you definitely should know. Absent is very abnormal, and that'd be a straight line, or zero beats per minute. This example here shows absent variability. You see it looks basically like a flat straight line. Minimal variability is one to five beats per minute, and it's shown over here. You see some movement, but not as much as normal. Again, moderate, which is normal, is noted here, and that's anywhere between six to 25 beats per minute. 
the majority of the tracings you see will be moderate, and market, which is abnormal as well, is anything greater than 26 beats per minute. When describing the variability of a tracing, you don't say the variability is 20 or 25, you just use one of these four words, so either absent, minimal, moderate, or marked variability. Accelerations. So an acceleration is an abrupt increase from the baseline. Abrupt is defined as less than 30 seconds. A lot of students may get confused by the difference between acceleration versus variability. The key way to differentiate them is by how high it goes from the baseline and how long it goes up for. The majority of tracings you will look at will follow this rule over here. So in order to be counted as an acceleration, it has to rise at least 15 beats over the baseline and has to last for at least 15 seconds. Let's take a look at this tracing. So we already established that the baseline for this tracing is here at 135 beats per minute. This area looks like an acceleration, but let's confirm. So we see it go up to around right here, and that's 155. If we're saying the baseline is here, 135, this increases by 20. And how long does it last for? It starts around here, and it ends around here. And remember, each of these are 10 seconds long, so this is also 20. Now let's take a look at this guy over here. So this goes up to around here, which is 145. We're saying the baseline is here at 135, so the difference here is only 10. Because it only rose 10 beats per minute and not 15, this is not considered an acceleration. This rule that we just talked about in particular applies only for fetuses at or greater than 32 weeks. If you're looking at a fetus who is less mature or less than 32 weeks in gestational age, then the rule changes from 15 by 15 to 10 by 10. So again, looking back at this one over here, since this raises by 10 beats per minute, and it also lasts for 20 seconds, this qualifies as an acceleration if you were looking at a fetus that was, say, 30 weeks in gestational age. If an acceleration lasts more than 2 minutes, but less than 10 minutes, we call that a prolonged acceleration. If the heart rate goes up and it stays up for longer than 10 minutes, this is no longer considered an acceleration, but instead we're calling it a change in the baseline. Remember, the baseline is an average over 10 minutes. Now let's review decelerations. When talking about decelerations, there's a wonderful mnemonic that's called veal chop. It's useful to help you remember the types of decelerations and also the underlying causes. So if you remember from earlier in the lecture, variable decelerations are caused by cord compressions. Or if you see a really bad variable deceleration, there's a risk that this may be due to cord prolapse as well. This is not good. Early decelerations are caused by compressions of the fetal head. This is caused by a vagal response causing the heart rate to go down. Usually this happens when the head is going down the vaginal canal and getting closer to a vaginal delivery. Early decelerations are the only decelerations that we consider good because what we want is happening and the baby is coming down and going through a vaginal canal. There are no decelerations that start with A, but to make the mnemonic complete, you could say accelerations, and these are okay. And finally, we have late decelerations. Late decelerations are due to placental insufficiency, and these are usually the worst kind of decelerations you'll see. Now let's talk about what each specific deceleration looks like. So a variable deceleration usually occurs with contractions. Remember the key thing is usually. It can occur before and after contraction as well. So this top tracing right here demonstrates variable decelerations. If you look at it, they almost look like upside down accelerations. You have an abrupt, again, that's less than 30 seconds change to the nadir. Nadir is the lowest point of a deceleration. The change from the baseline must be more than 15 beats per minute, and the whole deceleration must last for more than 15 seconds. Remember, for accelerations above 32 weeks, you're looking for 15 by 15. Variables, if you want to consider them upside down accelerations, are also 15 by 15. And as you can see here in this tracing, typically it occurs at the same time as a contraction, but you can have them also occurring before and after. And also another way to remember this, variables look like Vs. 
early and late decelerations are gradual. And by gradual, we mean it takes more than 30 seconds to reach the nadir or the lowest point of the deceleration. So in order to be considered a early or late deceleration, from here to the beginning of the deceleration has to be at least 30 seconds. The way we differentiate between early and late decelerations are the timing in relationship to contractions. Here we have an early deceleration, and what we see is the nadir of the deceleration corresponds with the peak of the acceleration. And if you look at the late deceleration here, the nadir of the deceleration comes after the peak of the contraction. Decelerations are considered recurrent if they occur with 50% or more of contractions. So if you have a tracing with five contractions and you see a deceleration after three of those contractions, then that's considered recurrent. But if you only see one or two decelerations after those five contractions, then that is not considered recurrent. After you get all four components of a tracing, you can use the combined information to call a tracing a specific category. And there are three categories, one, two, and three. A category one tracing is basically an either an A or A plus tracing. Everything is perfect. The baseline is normal. Again, that's 110 to 160. The variability is normal, and that's moderate. And remember, that's 6 to 25. You may or may not have accelerations. Accelerations are always a reassuring sign, but you don't necessarily need to have accelerations to be considered a Category 1 tracing. And there are no late or variable decelerations. Remember, these are the bad decelerations. But you may or may not have early decelerations. Remember, early is considered good because the baby is coming down and the head is getting squeezed. If you have a category one tracing, this is considered normal and you do not need to intervene. Let's skip category two for a moment and talk about category three. If category one was A or A plus, a category three is an F. These are the worst kind of tracings you'll see. So in order to be considered a category three, you'll either have to have absent variability, that's zero beats per minute variability, with either recurrent late D-cells or variable D-cells or bradycardia. So remember, recurrent means 50% of the time or more, and bradycardia is anything less than 110 beats per minute. So again, you'll have to have absent variability and one of these three things. Or you could have what's called a sinusoidal pattern. A sinusoidal pattern looks like a sine wave you remember from your trigonometry classes. If you see a category three tracing, you must act on this. So what you want to do is you want to examine the patient and you want to do a cervical exam. What you're looking for is either something that could be causing this, such as a cord prolapse, or you want to see if they are fully dilated and therefore could have a potential vaginal delivery. Then you can also do things that are supportive or resuscitative for the mother and the fetus. These are all measures to help get more blood and more oxygen to the fetus. You could change the maternal position. If a mom is lying flat on her back, the uterus can be compressing the IVC or inferior vena cava, and that could decrease cardiac output and decrease blood flow to the uterus. So one thing you could try to do is put the mom to the left or to the right side. You can give supplemental oxygen, but this is only really useful if the mother is hypoxic for whatever reason. If the mother is undergoing labor augmentation with something like Pitocin, you should stop Pitocin because you want to decrease contractions because contractions can cause further stress to the fetus and decrease oxygenation. Another thing you could do is give something called tocolytics. So tocolytics are medications that stop contractions. One example of this is terbutaline. We'll go into more detail about this later. And if the mother is hypotensive, which can be a common occurrence after receiving an epidural, you could give them a vasopressor or something to increase their blood pressure to help increase blood flow to both the mom and the placenta and therefore the fetus. If you try these measures and you see that the tracing is not improving, at that time it is very important to consider imminent delivery. If they are fully dilated, you could either have the mother push or you could assist with either forceps or a vacuum. If they are not fully dilated and they are remote from delivery, and at that time, you should consider doing a C-section for fetal benefits.
Now let's go back and look at category two. Basically, if anything isn't a horrible category three tracing or a perfect category one tracing, it ends up being called category two. So you could consider these your B pluses to C minus. These aren't all emergencies like category three, but they do require closer follow-up. Sometimes you can just monitor. Sometimes you'll go and do an exam and see what the patient is doing. And if need be, you can also do supportive measures to help remove any stress on the mother or the fetus as well. Let's go into a little bit more detail about tachysystole. So remember, tachysystole is if you're having more than five contractions over a 10 minute period of time. And this is actually averaged over 30 minutes. We get concerned about tachysystole because it can cause stress to the fetus. So although the definition says this is averaged over 30 minutes, if you are seeing contractions occurring less than every two minutes and there is a category two or category three tracing, you don't have to wait 30 minutes before you intervene. Intervention depends on what is causing the contractions. If someone is undergoing spontaneous labor and they have tachysystole, but they have a happy baby with a category one tracing, you do not need to intervene. However, if someone is undergoing spontaneous labor and has either a category two or category three tracing, that's when we will do the resuscitative measures we talked about in the previous slide. And again, you can also give a tocolytic such as tributylene to help space out the contractions and cause less stress to the fetus. Now, if someone is undergoing induction or augmentation of labor, the only difference in management is even if it's a category one tracing with a happy baby, you don't want to be causing toxicity yourself, so you'll decrease your augmentation agent. So you could either decrease Pitocin or whatever else you're using for augmentation. Management of a category two or category three tracing for someone who's going under augmentation is exactly the same as what you do for spontaneous labor. Montevideo units. One of my favorite, but also useless pimping questions is, Montevideo is the capital of what country? The answer is Uruguay, and it's named that by the doctors who came up with the unit. And the reason we called Montevideo units is because the two doctors who came up with the system were, as you guessed, from Montevideo. Remember, the only way you can measure the strength of a contraction is if you have an internal uterine pressure catheter or an IUPC. You cannot measure contraction strength with an external monitor. The way we calculate Montevideo units is we measure contractions over a 10 minute period of time, and we add them all together. When we're measuring a contraction, we're measuring the, we look at the value at the peak of the contraction and the resting tone. So for example, the resting tone is located right here. And for this patient, that is equal to 30. And the peak of this contraction is right here. And let's say that's about 70. So the strength for this contraction right here is equal to 70 minus 30, which is 40. For this one over here, the peak of this contraction goes only up to 60. The resting tone is still 30, so 60 minus 30 leads to a contraction strength of 30 over here. And finally, this one here goes up to 90. The baseline is still here at 30. So 90 minus 30 here is equal to 60. If you add all of these up together, that's 40 plus 30 plus 60, that equals 130. But remember, this has to be over 10 minutes. This over here is only two minutes. So although your calculations are correct, this is not an adequate length of time to determine the total MBUs, which have to be over a 10 minute window. And the reason we want to measure MBUs or contraction strength is because we want to see if the contractions are adequate to be causing cervical change. What's considered adequate is if over a 10 minute period, the total contraction strength is greater or equal to 200 Montevideo units. You should remember this number for your shelf exam. So if someone is considered adequate, we expect our cervix to be changing about one or two centimeters 
every hour or so. There is one important caveat though. We only look to see if someone's adequate if they are in active labor. Labor is divided into latent and active, with active being six centimeters dilated or more, and latent is anything that's less than six centimeters dilated. Now that we know how to read a field heart tracing, let's go over specific applications. During the NST, you must monitor the fetal heart rate and the contraction pattern for at least 20 minutes. Sometimes you can monitor longer if needed, up to 40 or greater minutes. An NST is considered reactive, which is a reassuring or a good sign, if you get two or more accelerations within a 20 minute period. An NST is considered non-reactive if you get less than two accelerations, so either zero or one, in a 20 minute period. If you are doing prolonged monitoring and say monitoring for 40 minutes and you see two accelerations, the first one around the five minute mark and then a second one around 35 minutes, even though there are two accelerations since they are more than 20 minutes apart, it is not considered reactive. A non-reactive tracing is not always a sign of field distress, but it is not reassuring, and because of this, you have to do further workup. And that could either mean monitoring the baby or the fetus for a little bit longer, or doing another kind of test, such as a BPP or a biophysical profile. During pregnancy, most people do not require antenatal testing. If you do require testing with an NST, when you start and how often you do it depends on the indication. In general, the rule of thumb is testing usually begins around 32 to 34 weeks, and it could be done weekly. If the indication is a severe one, you could start it as early as viability, which is around 23 to 24 weeks, and you could do it either weekly, bi-weekly, daily, or even multiple times a day. But again, in general, if you had to guess, I'd recommend saying 32 to 34 weeks and weekly testing. Here are some reasons that you'd want to monitor pregnancy. It could be divided either into maternal conditions that pre-existed before pregnancy, or pregnancy-specific conditions. The main overlapping theme, though, is that all these conditions put the patient at risk of having an IUFD or intrauterine fetal demise. These include diabetes, pre-existing or gestational, high blood pressure, either chronic or due to gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, antiphospholipid syndrome. If a patient has decreased fetal movement, we'll put them on a monitor just to make sure baby is okay. Poorly controlled hyperthyroidism hemoglobinopathies, maternal heart disease, oligohydramnios, which means low amniotic fluid, intrauterine growth restriction, late or post-term pregnancies, isoimmunization, a history of a fetal demise or poor outcome in a previous pregnancy, and multiple gestations, including twins, triplets, or higher order pregnancies. Another application for fetal monitoring is the CST, or contraction stress test. Like an NST, you are monitoring the fetal heart rate and the contraction frequency. However, unlike an NST, you're only doing it for about 10 minutes. And in order to have a successful contraction stress test, you need three contractions. And this has to be three contractions within the 10 minute period. If a patient is not spontaneously contracting, you could give them IV oxytocin, which is also known as Pitocin, or you could have the patient undergo nipple stimulation to cause the patient to release their endogenous oxytocin and also cause contractions. There are four possible results of a contraction stress test. It could either be negative, which is actually a good thing, and that means that you have no late or variable decelerations at all during your tracing. A positive test, which usually is a sign of placental insufficiency, is actually a bad result. And with a positive test, what you're going to see is you're going to see late decelerations with at least 50% of the contractions. So remember, this is the same thing as saying recurrent late decelerations. An equivocal test is somewhere between a positive and negative test. You have some decelerations, but they're not recurrent. So if you have three contractions, you may only have one late with one contraction. And an unsatisfactory test is what you get when you're unable to get enough contractions or if for some reason you can't read the tracing. It's important to note that if a vaginal delivery is contraindicated, you would probably want to avoid doing a CST.
For example, if someone has a placenta previa, this is not a good idea because a placenta previa is a contraindication for a vaginal delivery. Now let's do a few examples to really solidify what we've learned. This first example we could do together, and then the rest I'll have you pause the video and try on your own before we talk it out. So the first thing we'll look at here is the baseline. It appears the baseline is somewhere around here for this tracing, which is 135. Remember, a normal baseline is between 110 to 160. Now let's look at the variability. So it seems like the variability is fluctuating from here to around here, and this is about 10 beats per minute. So this looks like in the normal range as well. And again, normal is 6 to 25. So we'll say moderate variability. Now let's see if there are any accelerations. So this one here looks like an acceleration to me right here, but let's just count it out to make sure. So from here to here is about 30 seconds. The highest point of the acceleration is actually over here, and that's around 165. So 165 minus our baseline is 30. And remember, the criteria for an acceleration for anyone above 32 weeks is 15 by 15. So this definitely meets the criteria. So we'll say positive accelerations. I want to note one thing here. If you see the tracing is going up to 165, this does not mean that the fetus is under distress or there's fetal tachycardia. Fetal tachycardia is referring to what the baseline is at. So seeing the heart rate go up to 165 like this is not a bad thing. But in fact, in this situation is a positive thing because it's seen during the time of an acceleration. There are no obvious decelerations, so we'll say negative decelerations. And then let's look at the contraction frequency. The contraction frequency we measure from the beginning of one contraction, which is right here, all the way to the beginning of the next contraction, which is right here. This is about two minutes. So we'll say contractions, Q, two minutes. Overall, this is a category one tracing because it has normal baseline, normal variability. Accelerations are present, although that is not a requirement for a category one tracing, and there are no decelerations. You may have noticed a second tracing down over here. This I just included for the sake of completion, and it represents maternal heart rate during the tracing. Now, if you can, pause your video, try to figure out what this tracing is, the category as well, and then we'll go over it together. So for this tracing, I saw that the baseline was around here, so 120, which is normal. The variability, usually it's like fluctuating from here to here, about 10 or 15, depending on where you're looking, so I'll say moderate. There are no accelerations. If our baseline is 120, the highest that this tracing possibly goes up to is over here, which is less than 130 which is less than 10, so it does not meet the 15 by 15 criteria for a acceleration, so no accelerations. And the closest thing that looks like a D-cell is this right here. It has that V-shape, so it's possibly a variable, but let's look at it. From our baseline of 120, it goes down to 110, so it's a drop only of 10 beats per minute. In order to be considered a variable, remember a variable is sort of like an upside down acceleration, it has to go down for at least 15 beats per minute. Since this does not go down that low, this is not considered a deceleration, so I'm going to say no decelerations. The contraction frequency is the same as the last one, from here to here, and that's 2 minutes. So contractions Q2 minutes as well. Overall, this tracing is also a category 1 because it has a normal baseline, normal variability, there are no accelerations, but again, you do not need to have accelerations to be considered category one, and there are no decelerations. Here is our third example. Take a moment to pause the video and do the tracing first by yourself. So here the baseline is at 160 beats per minute. The variability looks a little bit less than before, usually around here to here, at least in that section, here to here, that still looks less than 5 to me. Here, it doesn't quite get to 5. And again here, so I'm going to say 160 and minimal variability. There are two areas that look like acceleration, so I'll look over here first. 
at this one right here and I see that it goes about 30 and it goes up to 175. So 175 minus our baseline of 160 gives us 15. So 30 by 15 meets the criteria for accelerations. So I'll say positive accelerations. And then our NA decelerations, that looks like two obvious ones to me. Here and over here, you have that V shape, which makes me think variable. Uh, let's just count it out just to make sure. Remember, the A variable has almost the inverse criteria of an acceleration, so it definitely goes down more than 15 beats per minute, and it lasts more than 15 seconds here. And we just want to also make sure that's an abrupt change. So remember, abrupt is less than 30 seconds. And from here to over here, this is only about 10 to 15 seconds. So it definitely meets the criteria for a variable. So what I'm going to say is positive variable D cells. Now let's look at the contraction frequency. You have one contraction starting over here. Your next contraction starts about here. The difference in time is about one minute. So let's say contractions, Q one minute. I would call this a category two tracing. It barely meets the criteria for a normal baseline over here. Remember, normal is 110 to 160, but it has minimum variability, which is abnormal, and it's having variable D cells, which are also abnormal. It's not so bad to call it category three, so therefore we'll call it a category two tracing. Take a moment to pause and complete example number four. In this tracing here, the baseline appears probably 145. In this section here, it appears a little bit lower, but in general, if you would average it out, it's probably on the higher area at 145. The variability appears moderate. Usually it's about 10, depending where you're looking. You have one acceleration here. So we'll say positive accelerations. And then let's look at these decelerations. I see about three decelerations. We have this variable here with your V-shape. And then you have these two gradual ones here and here. So in order to differentiate between a late and an early deceleration, we look at the nadir of the deceleration and the peak of the contraction. And if you look over here at this nadir and compare it to this peak, it appears about the same time. Now let's look at this one here. The lowest point of this deceleration and the highest point of this contraction also appear to be at the same time. So I would call these early decelerations. And normally if I was looking at this in the office or in labor and delivery, I wouldn't count out the seconds, but just to make sure, let's make sure it's actually gradual. So the start of the deceleration is over here and the nadir is over here and that is 30 seconds. And remember gradual is 30 or more seconds. So. So yes, that does meet the criteria for an early deceleration. So for here, I'll say positive early and positive variable. Contraction frequency here from here is about two minutes. So contractions Q2. This tracing is also a category two tracing. Overall, many of these features are positive and it almost meets the criteria for a category one tracing, except for the fact that there's this variable deceleration here. Otherwise, it has a normal baseline, normal variability, accelerations, and remember, early decelerations are the only decelerations that you can have in a category one tracing. So if this variable deceleration wasn't present, then this tracing would actually be category one. Okay, only two more examples left. Take a moment and pause your video now. The baseline for this one is around 165. So because it is greater than 160, this is considered tachycardia. The variability still looks likely in the normal range, usually around 10 beats per minute, so we'll say moderate variability. We have one acceleration over here that does meet the 15 by 15 criteria.
and we have two gradual decelerations here and here. So let's see if these are early or late. The nadir or bottom of this deceleration goes down and it looks like it's coming after the peak of this contraction. So this looks like a late deceleration. And for this one as well, the nadir or lowest point of this deceleration is again coming after the peak of the contraction, so this is also a late deceleration. In fact, since we have two contractions and we see two decelerations, we are having recurrent late decelerations. Overall, I would say this is a category two tracing again. Even though this is the worst one we've seen so far, it technically still has moderate variability and you need to have absolute variability with recurrent lates to be considered a category three tracing. Take a moment to pause your video and look at this tracing. Here the baseline is around 140. You're barely seeing this tracing fluctuate at all and in fact it looks more like a straight line so we're going to say absent variability. There are no accelerations and there are decelerations that look gradual here, here, and here. And it looks like their nadir always comes after the peaks of all these three contractions. Since these decelerations are occurring with more than 50% of the contractions, they're going to be called recurrent late decels. Just like we talked about with the last slide, because we have absent variability and recurrent lates, this is a category three tracing. This is a horrible tracing that needs to be acted on immediately. Resuscitative measures must be done and if they do not improve, delivery should be imminent. I just want to go over two special cases before we're done looking at tracings. You probably won't be tested on these, but you'll look very impressive if you know what's going on if you see them during your rotation. So over here we see what looks like a great tracing, but all of a sudden at this point, there is a drop in the heart rate and it stays down for here about one minute before it goes back up. So right here, this is likely not a deceleration and what's happening most likely is the mother moved causing the position of the fetus to move or perhaps changing the position of the monitor and this area we are just picking up maternal heart rate. So during this time period we don't actually know what's going on from here to here. Most likely it's probably good based off what's going on before and after but you can never know for sure so we can't say that this is actually good or bad but based off the overall clinical information, this tracing looks overall good, so I would not be too concerned about what's going on unless it looked worse before or later. And in this case here, I want to, you guys, instead of looking at the tracing, to look at the contractions. We have two contractions, our first one here and our second one here. The second one here looks a little bit different than all the contractions we've seen before. Can you guys guess what's going on? Again, although we don't know for sure, this looks like what we call toco pushing, where either the patient is actually pushing on the tocometer or she's flexing her stomach intentionally to create what looks like a contraction when there really isn't one. I've only seen this a few times during my practice, but usually the patient has some sort of ulterior motive to make you try to think that she's in labor. If you are suspicious for this, you could be in a room with the patient and feel her stomach or uterus during the contraction to see if you could actually feel it tightening and relaxing. It is important to keep in mind that there could be benign or reversible factors besides hypoxia that can cause changes in the fetal heart rate. One of the most common causes is a normal sleep cycle that babies have in the uterus. Usually these last for about 20 to 60 minutes and you can treat this sometimes either just by waiting or a little bit of juice and activity. Other reversible causes include medications such as narcotics and magnesium. Both of these will cause some temporary depression of the fetal neurologic activity. And again, this will lead to decrease in variability and also decrease in number of accelerations. Another medication that we commonly use during labor is terbutaline. And the change that you may see with this medication is a increase in the baseline of the fetal heart rate. Two common physiologic causes of fetal heart rate changes include maternal fever, and usually this will cause a increase in the baseline for example, if a patient has chorioamnitis, you could start to see fetal tachycardia. In this case, you could alleviate the fever by giving the patient Tylenol, and this should help bring the baseline back down to normal. 
Dehydration can also cause a change in the baseline, and you can alleviate this either by PO or IV fluids. Now let's briefly talk about mode of delivery. When managing a patient in labor, you're actually taking care of two patients, both the mother and the fetus. But in general, the principle is maternal well-being is greater of importance than fetal well-being. And by that, what I mean is, for example, if your patient was having a seizure, first you take care of the mom, make sure she stops seizing and that she's safe before you worry about any fetal distress. The second general principle is we always prefer to have a vaginal delivery over a C-section if it's safe for both the mom and the fetus. If there is ever a reason that prolonging labor would be dangerous for the mom or the fetus, then at that time we should consider doing a cesarean section. If you have a non-reassuring tracing and you're considering doing a C-section because of the tracing, you always have to consider what's the underlying cause of the distress. If it's a reversible cause, for example, maternal hypotension, then you should not do a C-section, instead you should treat that reversible cause. But if you have a non-reversible cause, for example, cord prolapse, then at that time, you know waiting will not do any benefit and in fact may cause more harm, so you should proceed with a C-section immediately. The next question to consider is, when performing these resuscitative measures such as repositioning the patient, giving them fluids or oxygen, how long can you wait before you give up? Or in other words, how long will the fetus tolerate more labor? And that depends on fetal reserve. If you have a healthy, normal fetus that has had a category one tracing until this current distress, then you have more time to act to help improve the tracing because the fetus has built up some reserve. However, if the tracing has been poor for a very long time, for example, if it's been category two for hours and it all of a sudden got worse, then at that time, you know you don't have as much reserve and can only spend a relatively less amount of time trying to resuscitate the mother before having to proceed with delivery. Another thing to consider is how much longer will labor actually last? Sometimes a multip can go from five centimeters to 10 centimeters within minutes and have the baby pushed out again within seconds. But if you have a primip who's closed and not really making much progress, then you know that this will probably take multiple hours or even days before the baby is delivered. So if you think delivery is imminent vaginally, then sometimes you could wait a little bit longer as opposed to proceeding with a C-section right away. The final thing is you have to always keep in mind if the C-section will be a complicated or simple procedure. Although you can never tell in advance, there are some things that will make you think it's more likely to be complicated. For example, if the patient has had multiple prior surgeries, she may have more adhesions, making it more difficult to operate. If the patient is very obese, it may inhibit your visualization and also make it more difficult. Or also, if the patient for whatever reason will decline blood, for example, if she's a Jehovah's Witness, then you'd rather be in a situation where everything is as controlled as possible, as opposed to a position where you wait too long, and now you have to rush during the C-section. So if you think that more likely that the patient will have a complicated C-section, then you should have a lower threshold for proceeding with delivery as well. Finally, it's really important to note what is the utility of tracing during labor. They have done studies where they compared external fetal monitoring versus just intermittently listening to the fetus to see if the heart rate was in a normal range. What they saw was the benefit of external fetal monitoring was it decreases the risk of neonatal seizures. It did not show any benefit in reducing cerebral palsy or perinatal mortality. But what it did increase was the rates of C-sections and also the rates of using vacuum or forceps assisted deliveries. So all of this makes it look like there's minimal benefit in terms of reducing risk of seizures, but it really doesn't reduce the risk of cerebral palsy and in fact, it increases their risks of these negative outcomes, which are C-sections and vacuum or forceps assisted deliveries. It is important to note that during these studies, high risk patients were excluded. By high risk, I mean patients with suspected fetal growth restriction, preeclampsia, diabetes. So it is difficult to generalize this to all patients you may deal with. That being said, the current standard of care is to have some sort of monitoring during labor, so most likely, you will not be seeing just intermittent auscultation in labor if your patient is laboring in a hospital in the U.S.
In this section, I'll include any mistakes that I may have mentioned during the lecture. Hopefully it remains blank. And finally, if you're interested in any additional reading, I'll include the links to this in the description for the video. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.